Okay, let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. Chapter 1, we established the context of the book of Revelation that, that we had John, the apostle, and he's been banished to this island uh, out in the sea, and he, he's been banished to this island. Oh, whoa, it just went backwards. There it goes. He has been banished to the island of Patmos, and, and we learned that it's Sunday morning, and here he is as a pastor on this prison island, and the churches that he loves, that he oversees, are these churches in western Turkey, modern western Turkey. It was called the province of Asia back in the Roman Empire. But here he is, he's there, it's Sunday morning. This would be like if, if a pastor from Oregon, like maybe Pastor Rob down in Corvallis, of Calvary Chapel, um, Corvallis, was praying, and he's been banished to Haystack Rock. And he's praying over the churches that he mentors the pastors of. It's a very similar dynamic. And so as he's praying, all of a sudden, Jesus appears as the answer to his prayers. And this is the context of Revelation, is Jesus appears to answer John's prayers for the seven churches. John's to write down what Jesus says to each church as a letter. It's not going to be John's thoughts. Instead, Jesus is authoring seven letters to these seven churches using words, an angel guide, visions of the future. And John is just the guy with the pen. That's the context of this entire book. Well, we looked at the first letter of the first church that he was praying over. It was the church of Ephesus. This is actually where he lived. And we've had these night vision goggles because that's what the book of Revelation is. They're simply night vision goggles so that whatever's going on in the world, we just look and we can see in the dark and know what's actually happening. That's what the book of Revelation is. Well, we learned last week that these Revelation not night goggles, they're like tactical lenses where you can press a button and get different views like, you know, infrared, you know, x-ray. Oh, wow, you guys look like skeletons. I mean, no. <laughs> and so we ended last week with like an archaeological lens. So we used kind of a surveyor lens. As we looked at Ephesus, this letter last week, we, we, we learned from our archaeology in Ephesus what happened is that Ephesus was this huge city. We compared it to New York City. Had this vibrant seaport. Well, over the years, this is the seaport of Ephesus today. It's silted in. And with just a couple hundred years from the time that John wrote this letter, Ephesus was abandoned because the, the, that seaport just silted in and cut them off from the sea. And how, what an, a metaphor, illustration of what was happening to the church at Ephesus. The first blank on your notes, the, the notes are in the bulletin. I'd encourage you to download the app because the notes are all there. It has all the scripture there. Just search for Calvary Mac in your app store. But the first blank is this, is Jesus appears to answer, uh, oh, excuse me, we already just read that. The next one, Ephesus, excuse me, appeared to be a strong, successful church. Yet despite all their ministry in a dark society, enduring hardships, and protecting the church with sound theology, they were on the verge of closing because their motive was no longer agape love. Instead, they were just functioning as a church out of obligation because it's what they're supposed to do. They started off so strong and because their motivation wasn't love, it was more what we're supposed to because that's the way we've always done it. It's like the, the, the seaport of their heart was getting silted in. And all of that ministry was worthless. And we, we talked about this, is that the only works God will accept are acts motivated by love. Now, this isn't talking about salvation. We are saved by grace through faith. That's how we're saved. This is talking about works or acts after we're saved, after we've been saved by grace. For example, I've been saved by grace. Nothing of myself. It was Jesus Christ and his righteousness that saves me. Now that's how I'm saved. However, me teaching is a work. 
Me coming up here and, and proclaiming the Bible and teaching the Bible is a work. If my motive is to do this because it's my job, God doesn't accept that. It's worthless. If my motive is to come up here and make you think, oh, wow, what an impressive speaker. God doesn't accept that. That's worthless. But if my motive is to come up here because I love God with my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I love my neighbor as myself, I love you, and I want you to hear the word of God, that's what God accepts. Does that make sense? Okay. So that was last week. Oh, we're done. Let's go home. <laughs> that was last week, the letter to Ephesus. But now we're going to travel up 40, 50 miles north to Smyrna. Now, as we go to the letter at Smyrna, there's a church that they are facing deadly circumstances. In fact, they're going to be confronted with decisions that are life or death circumstances. And what we're going to learn, and this is what Jesus is saying to them as they're struggling in these circumstances is this, is this is Jesus speaking to them. Never forget that I know. Stop being afraid and never bow. Lord, as, as we open this, this precious book and Lord, you've promised to bless us for reading it and listening to it and taking it to heart. God, we don't want to study this because of knowledge. And this morning, this message has lots of knowledge. It's all history and information. Well, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And we pray, even as I teach, Lord, it wouldn't be a bunch of information and knowledge that puffs me up or puffs people up with thinking they know this or that about the Bible. But this would be an act of love. Would you fill me with your spirit? Fill me with your spirit. Because, Lord, we, we need your voice, not some person's opinion. And that doesn't happen through eloquent speech or superior wisdom, but only through a demonstration of your Holy Spirit's power so that our faith doesn't rest upon man, but on God's power. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, we left off last week, verse 7, so let's pick it up in verse 8. To the angel, or we've learned that that, that word is, is for messenger or a literal angel. To the angel of the church, and we, we learned about this, that the, the angel, it, it could be interpreted as talking about a pastor. It could be interpreted as talking about a literal angel that's warring for the church. Which one is it? I don't know, but either one's kind of cool. So he, he's writing this letter to the representative of the church. And it's either a pastor or an angel. But he's not just writing to that. It represents the whole church. So this is written to the entire church at Smyrna. So as we look at this, each one of these letters, last week was the letter to the church at Ephesus. This week, it's, it's the church at, uh, church at Smyrna. And each one follows the same basic outline. Like we've all studied business letters when we were in middle school. We all forgot it, but here's the first century letter format, and it's going to follow this for each of the seven letters. It's going to be an address to the congregation, and then there's going to be a specific congregation. Then there's a signature of Jesus, who's the author of the letters. He's going to sign it. We sign our letters at the end of the letter. They sign their letter at the beginning of the letter so that you know who was talking and, and how they have the authority to speak. And then there's going to be an evaluation of Jesus for the church. And then a verdict based upon that evaluation, which would be pretty scary if Jesus gave us his evaluation of this church. Ooh. Then the answer. It's not the answer to the evaluation. It's the answer to, to John Prairie praying for them. So as John's praying, remember this, John's praying on the Sunday morning. He's praying over the seven churches. When he's praying over Smyrna and he's, he knows the circumstances they're in, then he hears a voice behind him that sounds like a trumpet and he turns and he sees Jesus walking among the lampstands and each lamp represented one of these seven churches. And then Jesus says, hey, you've been praying for Smyrna. Here's what to tell them so that they can thrive and survive. Here's the answer. And then there's future warnings. And then there's future promise. Each letter is going to follow this same basic format. So here's the address to the con congregation. So we know who he's talking to. 
to the angel of the church of Smyrna write. And so, well, here's the address. Okay, if Ephesus, we learned last week, Ephesus, we compared it to New York City. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Paul went there, and that's one of the reasons that the gospel exploded around the Roman Empire. It'd be like going to New York City. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Well, we kind of combined it between New York and Las Vegas last week because the two words that describe Ephesus are money and debauchery. So you kind of take New York and Las Vegas, if they had a baby, it'd be called Ephesus. So I was trying to think of, like, for Smyrna, what would Smyrna be like? And there was an obvious choice. San Francisco. (laughs) I left my heart in San Francisco. And here's why. It's because Smyrna was was famous for its beauty. Wealthy, huge city. Another one. And these first three cities are really huge. Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. All all three of them are big. But they all kind of you know, competed against each other for, 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 for influence and size. And so Smyrna is like this beautiful city on the bay, looked very much like San Francisco, but they, 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 they've actually found coins from Smyrna. And, and this is a Smyrna coin. And you can see it actually has Alexander the Great there underneath the palm tree. And they actually had, not on this coin, but on other coins, they found this. This is great is that their coin said, first of Asia in beauty and size. You know, like Utah license plates say, you know, greatest snow on earth. Well, they did have this on their money. Our money says in God, they, God we trust, they're said, we're the most beautiful and the biggest city in Asia. <laughs> Not Asia as a continent like we think of today. Asia was a province of the Roman Empire in West, it's today's Western Turkey. So they're like, we're the most beautiful and we're the biggest city were the best, right? They, it was, their money was advertising their greatness. And that's because they were constantly competing with Ephesus and, and, and Pergamum for which one was the biggest and the most influential. And so you look at this, and we talked about last week at the end how Ephesus was in decline over the next couple of decades. Within a couple of centuries, Ephesus was gone, abandoned, as soon as they were cut off from the sea, everybody left it. Well, guess where every, all that business went? To Smyrna. And so I, I came up with you know, one or two words to describe Ephesus. So I, was, I thought hard about this, like what's the one word to capture Smyrna? And this is what I came up with. We don't use this word a lot, but one word you could, you could use to describe Smyrna would be statist. Now that's a word we don't use very often. It's pretty uncommon, but it's actually a concept from Aristotle, is that a statist is committed to the government. Like, you're committed, you're, you're committed to a centralized authority of the government, and that was Smyrna. They were committed, they were fiercely loyal to Caesar, into the Roman Empire, even dating back before the Roman Empire, they were fiercely loyal to Rome. In in 195 BC, Smyrna, before the Roman Empire, they became the first city to establish a cult to Rome by building a temple for the goddess Roma. They just loved Rome. And then when Rome grew in power and the Roman Empire came on the scene, the Roman writer Cicero He called Smyrna the city of our most faithful and most ancient allies. Now, you have to understand that all three of these big major cities and across the Roman Empire, I mean, the cult of the empire, of of worshiping the emperor as a god, it was everywhere. But Smyrna was like the tip of the spear for this happening. The citizens of Smyrna were deeply committed to idolatry and the worship of the emperor. Imagine if we worshiped the president. Ugh. <laughs> I don't care who he is. Well, on one street called the Golden Street, see, it's San Francisco, right? On one street called the Golden Street stood magnificent temples to several gods of the Greco Roman pantheon. But the worship of those pagan gods was dying out. The real focus 
was on the worship of the Roman emperor. In fact, in, in 23 AD, just a few decades earlier, when Jesus was walking the earth, Smyrna beat out in a competition with 11 other cities to build the, the temple to worship Caesar Tiberius. And they did that out of, you know, oh, we love the Roman emperor. The emperor is great. You know, he's deified and we're going to, they, they competed, but we're going to build his temple in our city because they were so in love with that government. If you go there today, I mean, yeah, if you go Ephesus, there's tons and tons of ruins. The most ruins that they've dug up outside of Israel um, for New Testament cities. But Smyrna, not much is left. In fact, this is all there is. It's the Agora or the central area of the town. And the reason for that is Ephesus was abandoned. So nothing was built on top of it. Well, Smyrna has 3 million people living on top of it. So there's very little that has been excavated. Uh, it's a modern city of Izmir, which is the third largest city in Turkey. It's all built on top of the ruins, so they haven't been able to dig or find much. Otherwise, they're going to be digging up everybody's buildings and, and homes, and, they, and they're not going to do that. So the, the stuff that they have dug up is very limited and little. So that's the address. Here's the signature of Jesus. This is Jesus signing the letter. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. With these signatures of each letter, you can kind of draw a circle around them and draw an arrow right back to chapter one. When John was praying, and he's praying over these seven churches in these cities, and the voice of Jesus, which sounded like a trumpet, he hears it, and he turns, and he sees Jesus in his glorified form, and he describes Jesus and Jesus speaks. Well, how he describes Jesus and what Jesus says is how Jesus signs each letter. So last week, you know, John saw that in his hand were the arrow or the, 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 the stars which represented the pastors of each church and, and coming out of his hands. And so last week as, he's, as he, Jesus signs that first letter, the seven stars in his right hand represented pastors or angels. The seven golden lampstands represented the seven churches. Well, that's how John introduced the letter, or that's how Jesus signed the letter to Ephesus, because their church was having troubles with motivation for love, so their church was in danger of dying out. But here's the thing. The, authorit the authoritative statement Jesus signs the seven specific letters with are not random, but intentionally declares Jesus' sovereignty to address the circumstances of each church. So that signature to Ephesus, related to Ephesus. Same thing is going on here, is that Jesus signs the letter to Smyrna as the first and the last who died and came to life again because they need to know Jesus is sovereign God. They need to know it. They also need to know that death could not hold Jesus, and it cannot hold his people. So the question is, why would this statement matter to Jesus' followers in Smyrna? It's because they were rapidly facing the very real threat of violent, painful deaths because of what they believed. And they needed to know that Jesus was God or is God. And they needed to know that Jesus conquered death. This is the way Jesus would sign a letter if he was writing a letter to a church in North Korea. That they know that even though this government will kill them, if they find the one page of scripture that they have hidden in their wall, if a guard finds that, they'll be shot on the spot. They need to know that Jesus is God and that he conquered death so that if they get shot, they'll have life in eternity. They need to know that. Same thing that Jesus would sign a letter to a church in Iran. Same type of thing. He's going to tell them, never forget that I know. He's going to do that in the evaluation. Look at this. This is precious. Here's the evaluation of the church. Verse 9. I know. Those are two of the most precious words 
that you can hear from Jesus. Because some of you feel invisible. Some of you feel like nobody understands what you're going through. You're trapped in a loveless marriage, in a stagnant career, struggling week to week. Dreams have died. Well, this is clear. Jesus wants this church to know that he knows. He knows what they're going through. He knows what they've lost. They're not invisible. They're not forgotten. Jesus knows. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. Now, we said Smyrna, it was, you know, it's like San Francisco. But specifically, it's a specific part of San Francisco. It's, it's the south part. It's Silicon Valley. And the reason I say it's Silicon Valley is how Ephesus was, you know, it's at its peak. It's going to start declining because their seaport is silting up. And what that led to was an influx of new wealth into Smyrna. So there's this, it's an older city, but it's still getting infused with lots of new business and, and lots of new money. And by the way, Smyrna, do you know what Smyrna means? It means this. All right here. Abby, can you smell this? It's strong. You smell it? It's myrrh. In fact, the Greek word for myrrh is Smyrna. It's named after myrrh because myrrh was its number one export. Remember baby Jesus, the Magi, brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Very valuable. And so there's so much wealth coming out of this. This is like a, a growing, vibrant city, and it's going to continue to grow through the centuries while Ephesus is going to be in decline. So despite all this wealth and power and new money, the Christians led and lived in absolute poverty. And there's a reason why. It's that Jesus' followers in Smyrna, they suffered in part poverty due to economic persecution. As soon as someone became a Christian, they were fired from their job, robbed of all wealth and property, and cut off from society as a result of joining this sect. And Jesus wanted them to know, I know what you're going through. I know. You know this happens regularly around the world. You come to Christ in the Middle East, cut off, fired, if they let you live. You lose everything. Some of you know a bit of what this feels like. Now, I, 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 I wasn't going to say this, but I really felt like the, I should say this is, because I know there's a lot of opinions about vaccines, okay? And I'm not going to make it. This is not a statement on vaccines. But whatever side you're on, you realize people lost their careers over the vaccines. You realize that? I don't care what you feel about vaccines. You realize people lost their careers over it. Because they didn't want to take it. Regardless of your opinion on vaccines, have some compassion. Some of you know even more what it feels like to lose everything because you came out of a, a, out of a cult. You came out of Mormonism or, or Jehovah's Witness. Or around here, there's even a group of Scientologists. And if you leave, you're shunned. There's a church that calls itself a Christian church here in town that if you leave this church, you're shunned, cut off, lose everything, every relationship you have. That's just a glimpse of what happened to these Christians is as soon as they came to Christ in that community, the government came in and took all their property, came in and took all their wealth. They lost their, their, 
their, their social community. They lost everything to follow Jesus. And Jesus is sitting here going, I know. I know why you're living in poverty. It's because of me. Never forget that I know that. So here's the verdict. I know your afflictions and your poverty. Here's the verdict. Yet you are rich. You, know, you may look like you know, you're in poverty here on earth, but in eternity, you are exceedingly wealthy. You know, the author of Hebrews, he writes about this, this practice of when Christians came to Christ, they, their property was seized, their wealth was seized. Hebrews wrote about this. Look at what it says. This is crazy stuff. Look at this. Remembering those early days after you had received the light, after you accepted Jesus, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to an insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison. And look at this. This is one of the craziest things I've ever read in scripture. And you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. I don't know about you, but if the state of Oregon came and took my house, I would not be full of joy at that moment. And if they dared touch my motorcycle, <laughs> you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. What? <laughs> You know what they got that I barely understand? They got this. I haven't brought this illustration out in at least, you know, three days. <laughs> I got this from Francis Chan. I think it's one of the best illustrations ever. And I have to keep coming back to it because you, you take this rope. This rope represents your existence. Only this rope, you know, it goes out here. Imagine that this rope goes out the door, around the earth, comes back around about five, six, seven times, and then shoots off into the universe. That's how long eternity is. That's how long you're going to exist somewhere. But this little red part right here, that's our life here on earth. And most people... What they do is they do everything they can to become as comfortable and wealthy for this little red part. Actually, for this little part right here, where they can eventually someday retire when they're 60 or so. They retire, and then they have like a window of like 10 years where everything's great. And then their body starts really deteriorating, and then they die. And they call that wealth. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live for this. I want to live for that. And the church at Smyrna, they got it. Everything they had here was taken away. And you look at this, you're joyful at the confiscation of your property because you know they can take this, but they can't take that. Last week, Ephesus, the only works that God accepts are those where the motivation is love, not salvation. We're saved by grace through faith. But once we're saved, when we do works like teaching, but the motivation is love, that's earning eternal treasure, not earthly treasure. If my motivation is so that people think, oh, he's a great speaker, well, that's earthly treasure, not eternal. Well, the church of Smyrna, man, they were rich in eternal treasure, There are both finite and infinite riches. When we die, which every single person in this room will die, at some point, maybe tomorrow, maybe in 50 years, all of us will die. Well, at that point, all finite earthly wealth we've acquired disappears. Elon Musk, when he dies, all the money won't save them, it's gone. However, 
the infinite heavenly investments, those riches acquired through acts of faith via the motive of love are eternally rewarded. And Jesus is saying to his followers in Smyrna, they may have made you finitely poor on earth through robbery, but you are exceedingly wealthy in eternity. Do you remember the church at Ephesus last week? We had the can of Dr. Pepper. And man, it looks good. You look at the church at Ephesus, man, it... In the world's evaluation, man, it was an A plus because it looked great. All these programs, care, you know, it's like feeding people, all this ministry going on. Anybody, and this is the type of church that if, if they would hold conferences, other churches would come to to find out their ministry strategies. What are you guys doing? Oh, how's your worship band? You okay? So A plus, but then remember we opened this can last week and it was empty inside. The inside didn't match the outside. The world evaluates via appearance. Jesus evaluates via our motivation. There was no love. So that was Ephesus. Let's check out Smyrna. Okay. Doesn't even look good. It's probably a dented can. It's living in poverty. But when Jesus evaluates it, it's full of delicious, wonderful, carbonated prune juice. <laughs> Living in poverty, probably not a church that other churches would come to learn how to have their phone go off in the middle of church. They were full of love. As we learned last week, well, if the only works God will accept are acts motivated by love, then Jesus' verdict of the Smyrnian church or believers' eternal riches reveals that their motive, motivation to withstand persecution was a deep love for God. And Jesus is saying, I know that you love me. I know it's real. It's not empty. I know. Never forget that I know. Never forget it. But he's going to move on to the answer. So as you look at the answer, remember, it's not the answer to the evaluation or the verdict. Because unlike every other church except one, there's no critique. There's, there's no... There's no, hey, you're doing this good, but I have this against you. None of that. It's all good. There's no critique. The answer is, remember, that John, he's praying over Smyrna, and he turns, and he sees Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, you write this letter to Smyrna. This is what to tell them. This is the answer to your prayer that they would shine in a dark culture. This is what they need to know. This is the answer. I know. Man, when Jesus repeats himself, you should listen. And he keeps saying, I know, guys. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Whew. That'd be the equivalent of saying, I know there's a church that claims that they're Christians, but they're not. They are a church of Satan. Whoo. Now, this verse, in the synagogue of Satan, that phrase is going to come up again in one of the other letters, has been used to justify anti-Semitic acts by evil, evil men. It's not what Jesus is saying here. It, it, that is garbage. So what is the synagogue of Satan? We got to figure this out. You know, if, you know, what is happening in Smyrna? So remember the context, you know, John's praying and as he's praying over Smyrna, he knows, because he oversees this church, he knows the dynamic that's happening in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum, these three huge cities. He knows the growing tensions happening there. He knows what's going on here. 
So he's praying over this, this hostile dynamic. So let's talk about Smyrna for a second. And these dynamics were everywhere. It's the Roman Empire. But the tipping point was here in Smyrna. Dynamic number one is emperor worship. So emperor worship was building across the Roman Empire. So religious freedom in the Roman Empire, I mean, it provided religious freedom. You could worship whoever and whatever you wanted as long as you, worship, you brought the emperor and the goddess Roma into your pantheon of gods and fought for the peace of Rome. If you did those, you could worship whatever you wanted. But here in this city, it was emperor worship, this dynamic that was happening. And we already learned that Smyrna, I mean, they, they, they beat out all the other provinces and all the other cities to be able to build the first temple to a Caesar right there in town. And so emperor worship had begun as an expression of gratitude to Rome. But Emperor Domitian, the same Caesar who banished John to Patmos in 80, 90, it should say 95 there, he was the first to require worship as a test of political loyalty. So at least once a year, you had to go, if you're a Roman citizen, or if you were living in Smyrna, you had to go and pinch powdered incense and throw it onto this altar in an act of worship and loyalty to the emperor. Well, that brings us to the dynamic number two, Jewish exception. The Jews enjoyed special dispensation in the Roman Empire. They were exempted from the obligation provided they offered in their synagogue, not a pinch of worship to the emperor, but a pinch to the health of the emperor. So the Jews, they wouldn't have anything to do with, you know, there's no other God but Yahweh. I mean, that's one of the Ten Commandments. And so they wouldn't do this as worshiping the emperor. They would, it's a prayer because incense was used as a, a metaphor of prayer. We're going to pray to the health of the emperor that you would help him to be healthy. So that's what they were doing. So they didn't have to, to worship the emperor. Everybody else did. So you have emperor worship and then the Jews are, accept, are exempt from it. Dynamic number three, Roman realization. So for most of the first century, the Romans looked at Christians as just a branch of Judaism, just a sect of Judaism. However, they realized the Christians are not just a sect of Judaism. And from the moment that the Roman Empire realized that Christians were not what they had thought, a sect of Judaism, Christians were no longer covered by the special Jewish exemption to emperor worship requirements, which led to dynamic number four, is Christian choice. Is that Jesus' followers were confronted with a life or death choice in Smyrna. Would they deny the emperor or would they deny Jesus? And the answer to that question meant life or death. William Barclay, he wrote this, all that the Christians had to do was to burn that pinch of incense, say Caesar is Lord, receive their certificate, they would actually get a certificate that said they fulfilled their religious obligation, and go away and worship as they pleased. But that is precisely what the Christians would not do. They would give no man the name of Lord that name they would keep for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. They would not even formally conform. So you have those four dynamics, which led to the fifth dynamic is Jewish slander. So understand that when Paul came through this area and shared Christ and started churches across Asia, as he's going through here, most of the first Christians were Jewish because he would start in the Jewish synagogue and he would lead them to Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. And they would find Christ and then they were, would they leave the Jewish community and go and live among the Christian community. Well, the Jewish, Jewish community felt betrayed. 
by those Christians, not just betrayed, but they felt that they were denying Yahweh by going and worshiping Jesus. So with that in mind, the feeling of betrayal led to resentment, led to Jews denouncing Christians to the Roman authorities, which in turn removed their special exemption, which confronted Jesus' followers with the life or death decisions. Do you see what's happening? It'd be like this, you know, so I, I'm a Jewish guy in Smyrna, and here's a Christian over here, and this, this Roman guard thinks that they're one of us. He so, hey, 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 that guy right there, he's not a Jew. He's not exempt. You need to go see if he'll, if he'll choose to worship the emperor or not, because he's not a Jew. Why don't you go check it out? The guard would go over, say, hey, pinch the incense, worship the emperor. The Christian would say, no, I have no king but God, but Jesus Christ and they'd be arrested on the spot. Do you see how this happened? So as it talks about the synagogue of Satan, Jesus is saying, I know. I know what's going on here. Thus, when he said he knows about the synagogue of Satan, Jesus was saying, never forget that I know about this group of Jews in Smyrna who are serving Satan's purposes, not God's, when they oppose Christians and slander them before the Roman authorities to get them arrested and killed. He's saying, never forget that I know and stop being afraid, which is exactly what he says here. Look at this. Do not be afraid. In Greek, the phrase is literally stop being afraid. Stop being afraid of what you are about to suffer. So you figure the, the, the Christians in Smyrna, they'd already lost everything. They're now living in poverty. They're under threat that they could be made to, to, to forced to worship the emperor at any moment. And when they're forced, they're not going to worship the emperor. You know, so often when we talk about martyrs, like, you know, here's Fox's book of martyrs. Just stories. We have a rich, deep heritage of martyrs, of people who have given up their lives for Jesus. It's all here in the book of martyrs. If you're, you know, we're, if you grew up in the 90s, you probably saw Jesus Freaks. Okay, phenomenal. You can still order it. It's phenomenal. It just has stories from this book of, of Christians who died for their faith and then updated with a bunch of Christians. This one just updated a bunch more. Phenomenal. So often when we read stories about these martyrs, it's like, oh man, they're full of such courage. That courage came from the Holy Spirit. I, I think that we, we don't realize or recognize how much fear they were having to deal with. Well, the Greek phrase here, it, it's literally stop being afraid, stop being afraid. It reminds me of Psalm 46. Look what Psalm 46 says. God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and mountains fall into the sea, the heart of the sea, though its, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Jumping down to verse seven, Yahweh Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what Yahweh has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. That there is one of the most precious lines in scripture. I know be still and know that I am God. There's an old Stephen Curse Chapman song. It's be still and know that I am God. One of the most precious songs in my life. There's times like, you know, when, when my marriage was falling apart in Colorado, I would just listen to that song over and over. Be still and know that he is God. Be still and know that he is holy. I just listened to it over and over or if there's financial troubles or whatever it is, I'll listen to that song because it reminds me, he is God. He's still on the throne and he knows 
what I'm going through. Well, Jesus is declaring to these Smyrna believers, stop being afraid. You don't need to fear threats and suffering. You can be still and know that I am God. This is the answer to John's prayer for Smyrna. Jesus wasn't promising to take away their torment, but assuring them that they don't need to fear because he is God and he is with them in their suffering. I want you to notice here, and we're getting now to the the warnings, the future warnings. He doesn't correct them for a fatal flaw like Ephesus or the other five of the other churches. It's not some fatal flaw he has to correct with a future warning if they don't. But instead, listen to what Jesus' future warning is for the church at Smyrna. I tell you, the devil. Okay, who was behind what the Jews were doing? The synagogue of Satan. So Jesus is saying, I know these guys. They're claiming, hey, well, you know, they're, they're not Jews. We're Jews. So we don't have to pinch it, but they do. We're Jews. And Jesus is saying, they're not Jews at all. They're a synagogue of Satan. Satan's behind what they're doing. Well, here, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Circle that phrase, for 10 days. It's important. Because as John prayed over Smyrna from Patmos... No doubt he prayed for their protection from persecution, but Jesus does not promise to take away their suffering. Instead, he warns more demonic-inspired persecution is coming. Now, we've talked about who this is for and and what's going on here, and I I have showed you the four, four prominent ways of interpreting the book of Revelation. I've told you that I take the book of Revelation from a futurist perspective. I understand other perspectives, but I'm just saying this is the perspective I'm coming from. Now, within the futurist perspective, that historist perspective is the first three chapters, where the first three chapters represent the ages of the church, the church age. And it goes through from 33 AD all the way up till today, and there we are with our lights and stages. These letters lay it all out, the whole history of the church. So as we look at this, you know, last week, that, that, that first, that letter to Ephesus very clearly lays out the apostolic church, that age when the apostles, and there are no apostles today, I don't care what Bethel tells you. Be careful down there, guys, if you are into Bethel. But anyway, anybody who claims to be an apostle, man, watch out for lightning bolts. (laughs) Apostolic church, you're an apostle. You were handpicked by Jesus and trained by Jesus, including Paul. So that was that apostolic church that started with the motivation of love and lost it. Well, the church at Smyrna, it represents the persecuted church. I put starts around 98 just because that's when the last, around when the last apostle John died. And it goes up to 315 when Constantine ended Christian persecution. You know, plus or minus 98. I mean, it started earlier with, with Nero. <laughs> and, and you look at all that stuff that happened there, and we've talked about Nero. But as we look at this, we, the question is, well, what are the 10 days? Again, we go to our, our tactical lenses here that we have the night. Oh, that's the wrong way. I don't want to blind you guys, so... Tactical lenses, night vision. Well, if, if we just, you know, look at, you know, what are the 10 days? As we look at 98, 95 AD, what was happening? The 10 days were, were likely just 10 literal days of intense persecution in the near future of AD 95. But if we switch the lens and, and we look at the historic, histor, historist lens and we look at that, the 10 days depicts the age of the persecuted church, which was give or take, a, you know, 180 to 315, symbolizing, symbolizing the 10 Roman emperors that are historically known to have intensely persecuted Christians. Because Nero, you know, Nero in the 60s AD, you think the 60s were bad in America. 60 ADs, they were bad. Nero. 
and all this stuff. That his, this guy was a nut job. We've talked about how in Luke, we were, we were reading in Luke and looking towards what was going to happen and lighting Christians on fire to light his garden parties. He did worse than that. He would light the roads uh, the, to, to the Colosseum. He would light them with Christians. He'd pit, cover them in tar, light them on fire, and ride on his chariot playing the lute or the, the, the lyre. Lear. He, he'd play it and sing as he'd go in between burning Christians. This guy was sick. That was just the beginning. We know from history that this is just the beginning. Fox's Book of Martyrs says that there were five million Christians killed during this time. Five million. And the population of the earth back then was not eight billion people. It's a lot of people. Persecution, left and right. Now, as you look at this, this church age, well, what's the 10 days? If you study persecution, you probably know the answer. If you read this, this book isn't about revelation. It has nothing to do. It doesn't talk about the 10 days. But you know in this era, there were 10 waves, 10 waves of persecution. There were 10 Caesars that launched persecution of the church. There were other Caesars that stopped it. But you can count them up. You know, even in Fox's books, here's the eighth persecution. Here's the sixth persecution. There were 10 waves. Well, Fox's book of martyrs estimates that over 5 million Jew, Jewish Jesus followers were killed as martyrs between the end of the first century and AD 315 when Constantine made Christianity the official state religion. And this letter was written to encourage every one of them sitting in prison waiting for their death. Jesus was saying to all of those persecuted Christians, never forget that I know. Stop being afraid. You don't have to be afraid. And you know what? Don't bow. And that's where we get to here with the future promise. Verse, uh, the end of verse 10. Be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. The Greek word there is stephanos. It's the crown of life. And there's two different words for crown in Greek. One of them is for a king's crown. And the other is the victor's crown. And that's what we have here, the word stephanos. And so basically, this is what he's saying. If, if you, you be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you your victor's crown. Here's a picture of a victor's crown. This is what we use today. It's metals, gold, silver, and bronze. We don't use wreaths. We use, we use, we use gold medals. You know, interesting, uh, in 2017, there was this guy in England. He's going through boxes he inherited from his great-grandfather, and he found this. It's worth a little bit of money. This is a golden wreath. This is from 300 BC. So this is actually from Greece. So this is from 300 BC. And this was from, it's either a wedding or for an athletic competition. And they would give them a crown. They would give it to them. In, in the Roman Empire, it was you know, famously the, the, the wreath, a lot cheaper than gold. Paul talks about the wreath that you know, all the, run, the athletes that compete to win the wreath, you know, the gold medal, but it's going to wither. You know, it's going to, it's going to end. Those wreaths that, that dwindled represent this red. You want a, a crown of life that lasts for eternity. And so Jesus, he knows what the believers at Smyrna are going through and says to them, you deserve and will receive an eternal gold medal of victory, the crown of life that symbolizes your eternal life you have in me. John Wolvard, he said this, what Jesus said to this church is important, but what he didn't say is also important. Jesus didn't have a single word of rebuke or correction for the Christians in Smyrna. All he had was the promise of a crown and the encouragement to be faithful until death. Never forget that I know what you're going through. Don't be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. But never bow. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says. 
to the churches. We asked this question last week. Who's speaking, Jesus or the Holy Spirit? Yes. It's yes. John is writing the words. He hears Jesus speaking. Literally, Jesus is dictating this letter. Anybody who says Jesus never wrote an epistle doesn't know scripture. Jesus, John's just writing it down. But the Holy Spirit is at work too, both at the writing of the letter and in those who hear the letters of the seven churches today. The Spirit speaks to those who read aloud the words of this prophecy. It's what we're doing right now. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. That's what's happening right now. And when you look at this, you know what this is saying? Is that even though this letter is written to a historical church in 95 AD, it is relevant to our life today. You just have to have ears to hear it. This isn't like some mysterious thing we got to figure out. It's just blessed for hearing it because it applies to our lives today. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Those who are victorious in Jesus receives that victor's crown that will not and will not face the second death. Here's the question. What on earth is the second death? We don't have to guess. Because he tells us exactly what it is. We didn't say this last week, but you can look at the, the first three chapters. These letters are not separate from the rest of Revelation that talks about the future. They're connected. In fact, the seven letters, they'll each find fulfillment in the last chapters of Revelation. So we know what the second death is because if we turn to the end, Revelation 20, it tells us what the second death is. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life had accepted Jesus as their savior was thrown into the lake of fire. The second death is the lake of fire or hell. And we'll talk about all the different images and words to describe hell in the book of Revelation because there's several. And we'll talk about what they mean. Though Satan led evil men to attack and persecute them in this finite life, Jesus promises he is his overcomers that eternal death is conquered for them. I just love how D.L. Moody said it. And it just captures the whole thing. He who was born once will die twice. If you're born once, you'll die physically all of us will, and you will die spiritually for eternity. He who is born twice will die once. If you're born twice, that means you're born physically, and then you're born again by accepting Jesus as your Savior. You'll die physically, but you won't die spiritually. You'll live for eternity. He who is born once will die twice. He who is born twice will die once. That'd be a good bumper sticker. All right, we'll have the band come on up here. But just like last week, the Holy Spirit, you know, we have these tactical lenses called the book of Revelation. And we have all these views of each of these letters and they're all applicable. They're all true. The first lens we can look at is the AD 95 lens. Is that this letter to Smyrna shares an evaluation and encouragement for the historic church that existed in Smyrna from 95, 95 AD from Jesus to just tell them to never forget that I know, stop being afraid, and never bow. It was written to them, but it was also written to share the future of the ages of the church, the historist lens. This is true as well. The letter of Smyrna depicts the persecuted church age that existed from around 100 AD to 315 until Constantine ended Christian persecution in AD 315. But also, I changed the name of this lens. Okay, we, we called it the 2022 lens. I didn't like it. We're gonna call it the church lens, the modern church lens. So it's kind of like an infrared lens. You know, we look this way, but if you actually look at what the church looks like today, the infrared view, seeing what, what isn't always obvious. 
is that the letter of Smyrna depicts persecuted churches that exist today and have in every church age. Did you know this is as conservative of an estimate as you can get? There's some estimates that are significantly higher than this, but just from the most conservative estimates, there are 7,000 to 10,000 Christians martyred every single year today. There's more people facing martyrdom on the planet today than in the history of earth. The radical Islam killing Christians. Martyr, it's a Greek word that just, it's driv, 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 derivative of the Greek word that just means witness one who chooses to suffer death rather than to deny Christ. It's going on everywhere. There's Christians in the Middle East being crucified today simply for being a Christian. There's pastors who, if they were found out, would be killed, imprisoned, imprisoned for years. There's just normal people who just go to church. This young woman, she was cut with a machete for being a Christian. They were trying to kill her, cut her head off. You know, these stories and more, if you're not getting the Voice of the Martyrs magazine, what are you doing? It's free. Every month, they'll send you stories of Christians facing martyrdom around the world. You can go to their website, persecution.com. They'll, they'll show you pastors, how long they've been in prison. And you can even write them a note of encouragement. It's phenomenal. So this is happening today, right now, in places like North Korea, China, the Middle East. Colombia down in South America. It's everywhere. And Jesus is telling them, the pastor who sits in a prison in North Korea today, never forget that I know, even though nobody else does, I do. Stop being afraid. You don't have to fear. And never bow. Then we have the personal lens. Is that the letter of Smyrna encourages individual believers in any church, including Calvary Mac facing opposition or persecution for Jesus. It's the same message. And I know we're late. I know we're late. But I can't. This would be an incomplete message without this. Is what happens in history. So we ended last week by looking at the archaeological lens. This is like a history lens of what actually happened in Smyrna. Is that there was a young man who was sitting in the church of Smyrna. And his mentor, the man who discipled him, was on an island in Patmos. And they come, and, and this young man is 25 years old at this time. He's sitting there as the letter from John written by Jesus is read to his church, and he listened. That young man's name was Polycarp. So Polycarp, he's listening to this. Well, Polycarp eventually, discipled by John, becomes the leader of the church at Smyrna. And and as he's there, as he lives his years, he lives to be 86 years old before he's finally arrested and he's brought into an arena to be burned at the stake. And he refuses to be tied up. He says, the Lord will give me strength. But listen to what happens. It's the earliest story of martyrdom that we have in a manuscript outside of the New Testament. Listen to what happened to him. But as Polycarp entered the stadium, there came a voice from heaven, be strong Polycarp and act like a man. And no one saw the speaker, but those of our people who were present heard the voice. And then as he was brought forward, there was a great tumult when they heard that Polycarp had been arrested. Therefore, when, when he was brought before him, the proconsul asked if he were Polycarp, and he confessed that he was. The proconsul tried to persuade him, saying, have respect for your age. You're old. You know, have respect. And other such things as they were accustomed to saying, swear by the genius or guardian spirit of Caesar, repent. Proclaim Caesar's God. But when the magistrate persisted and said, swear the oath and I will release you. So Polycarp solemnly looked at the whole crowd of lawless heathen who were in the stadium, motioned toward them with his hand, and then groaning as he looked up to heaven and replied, for 86 years I have served the Lord Jesus Christ and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? He goes on, they interact more and I'll jump to the end. The officers lit the fire 
and Polycarp was burned at the stake. When the flames were miraculously prevented from consuming his body, his executioner was ordered to stab him with a dagger. So make no mistake, Polycarp was a young man around 25 years old when he sat in the church at Smyrna and the pastor read the letter that Jesus addressed to his church. And he took it to heart. Six years later, he put Jesus' message into practice to never forget that I know. Stop being afraid and never bow. Let's stand.